Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross and it is time for a preview of the men's quarterfinals at the 2021 Australian Open. A couple of things off the bat, some housekeeping. If you are on Twitter, I do tweet about tennis. The handle to follow is at Gil underscore Gross. Monday Match Analysis is available on all podcast platforms. Please do subscribe if you are a podcast listener, and if you are an Apple podcast listener, leave a rating and a review. Before I get into these quarterfinal previews, and I'm really excited for these four matches, I think they're going to be great. The the round of 16 was a little bit underwhelming in parts. The women's were, were great, but the men's were not very good, and I will cover those matches because as I work through these quarterfinal matchups, I will address how the players got there especially and particularly uh, what they did in the round prior. So I will cover those matches, but they weren't great. And some of them were hijacked by injury, which it's not atypical. And sometimes you just have, have slams that kind of are hit with the injury bug. But this has been strange because they all seem to have the same injury. Very strange. Everyone's got hurt abs. Everyone's hurt their abdominal muscles, strained their abdominal muscles. Novak Djokovic, Alexander Zverev, Kasper Ruud, Matteo Berrettini, Pablo Carreno Busta. I don't know what was going on with Roberto Bautista Agut in the first round against Radu Albert. But some people on Twitter were saying it was his abs. Not confirmed, but I did see that. All these guys, Ruud, Berrettini, PCB, they all had to retire or withdraw. Novak Djokovic, well-documented. He thought he tore his oblique. I don't think it's torn. He, he didn't reveal the result of his imaging, but uh, it, it, it was probably just strained or something a little bit less severe than a, than a tear because he's recovered. He's in the quarterfinal, and he could hit forehands against Milos Raonic. More on that a little bit later, and plenty on Djokovic. And even his opponent, Sasha Zverev, said in the early rounds his abs were bothering him and he could not serve full speed. I'm leaving out Nadal, who had a back, and I'm leaving out some of the the other players who who have had various injuries. But it, the ab injuries are are weird, and probably something beyond coincidence. You can never rule out that it's coincidence, but uh, I think there's too many of them. I think something's going on, and I think the the best explanation is: look, these guys go from not playing matches and there is no substitute for matches. You have this very strange two week training block in Melbourne. And then a lot of them played ATP cup and you're playing every day. Team Italy went far. Team Germany went far. Serbia went far. Spain went far. These guys are all, you know, most of these guys played ATP cup and they played every day. Uh, Except the day that was canceled, right? And then suddenly you're playing best of five. So you go from zero match play to every day to best of five, and you don't get a break there, and it's taken a, a real toll. And then I read something interesting written by George Belishaw with uh, Metro. Uh, he interviewed Matt Little, Andy Murray's longtime trainer of 13 years, and Little said, look, it's the serve. It's the serve. That is the stroke um, that you really need to worry about in terms of injury when you have not played for a while. And the the shoulder muscles and clearly now the ab muscles are in a really vulnerable spot when you when a, a, an athlete has inactivity in some of those muscles and then they go to serve. So clearly uh, you know I'm I'm curious to to hear what's going to be said about this because it's a an inordinate amount of abdomen injuries. So I just wanted to kind of cover that right off the bat. I think it's been a big story in the tournament. And now, without further ado, let us get to our quarterfinal prediction. So I'm just going to throw up a graphic on the screen. Here we go. Here we go. There it is. Okay. Um, wait, but I don't want this one. No. Let me go back. There we go. Let's start with Djokovic and Alexander Zverev. And again, we'll start with their with, with their round of 16 matchup. So Djokovic defeats Milos Raonic in four sets. The question coming in, was he going to take the court? Was he going to play? And if he was going to play, how limited was he going to be? And ultimately, he showed discomfort. 
but not limitation. And, you know, what I mean by that is, did he look like he was in pain at times? Yes. Was he addressing the injury? Yes. But during the point, did it seem to be a real problem? No, not really. And, I mean, there were a couple moments where he chose not to hit an open stance sliding running forehand. But I think most of those moments were points that that Novak probably wasn't going to win in the first place. He kind of looked down and out. Uh, but w without f getting further into it, the, the reality is that Djokovic won the match and he bought himself more time to heal. And that's what really matters here. And that's what Nadal did early in the tournament. Survive, advance, heal. If you're able to do that, you're in good shape. And it appears Djokovic did do that. Again, he, he probably strained his oblique and did not tear it because tears get worse. Tears don't get better. They don't heal. You, you got to rest them in order for them to heal. But, you know, ultimately, I am not someone who thinks that Milos Raonic is boring to watch. I appreciate him. I don't think he's a serve bot. I, I think he brings a lot to the table. I really like his game. I wish he would emote more emotionally. But I, I, I'm a, I like Milos Raonic. I just want to say that before I go into how I feel about this matchup. When Novak Djokovic plays Milos Raonic, I find their matchups predictable. I find their matchups repetitive. I find their matchups uninteresting. Novak seems to read Raonic's serve really, really well. He puts him back in play more than Milos is used to. He puts him back in play with interest. They get into baseline rallies. Novak Djokovic finds the Milos Raonic backhand, and it cannot hang. The backhand cannot hang. Plain and simple. He, but he, he's toast. He's toast in the baseline rallies, and Djokovic can get there with his return. I don't think that Milos plays with enough fearlessness when he plays Novak. The fearlessness required to overcome the number of returns that are being put back in play. I think you need to respond by serve and volley with, you know, making sure that when you get that first forehand, that you punish it, that you go big. And uh, I don't know why I think Raonic was fearful to slice his backhand, you know, to, to chip and charge and, and do things like that. And it just... It just doesn't seem like Raonic believes at all when he plays Novak Djokovic. And uh, it was a four-set match, and Raonic played well in the in the second set, and he won it. But then the next two were were quite easy for Novak Djokovic. And again, I, I don't think that there is is all that much to this other than um, Raonic. It's a terrible matchup for him because he he does not get as much. Uh, he does not get as much as he needs to out of his serve. And when that happens, you know, he doesn't play Djokovic well uh, behind his serve either. So it's it's not a good combination. Alexander Zverev beat uh, Dusan Laovic in three sets. Zverev has not dropped a set since uh, the opening set of the tournament when he played Martin Giron. Uh, he did play Adrian Manorino. Those are his two seeds. I said at the beginning of the tournament that this is an, an incredibly favorable draw for Sasha Zverev. His seeds were nice. Dusan Laovic prefers a slower court than this. Adrian Manorino has never been a giant killer. He has never been that kind of player to uh, upset high seeds. So I thought this was nice for Alexander Zverev. And he comes into this uh, match against Novak Djokovic relatively unscathed and well-rested, which I, I, you know, we should remember was a problem for him early in his career in the majors. Zverev versus Djokovic. Novak leads the head-to-head 5-2. It's 4-1 on hardcourt. Zverev's last win came in 2018 at the uh, NITO ATP Finals. I don't generally like the way Zverev plays Djokovic. I generally don't. I don't think he, he generally speaking, plays Novak great. I think he plays much better, Zverev does, against like a Roger Federer. And I think I have a pretty good hypothesis for why that is. I think Novak tends to lull Zverev into passivity. There's a very simple reason for that. I think that Novak's court coverage is intimidating. His defense is intimidating. And that forces Zverev or incentivizes Zverev 
to stay in his comfort zone. We all know that Alexander Zverev's comfort zone is defense, grinding, passivity. That's his comfort zone, right? He, he wants to trade, right? He I'm not saying he wants to run around the court and, and be dictated against. It's not what I'm saying, but he wants to trade. And he does not mind passing up an opportunity to attack to lengthen a rally. He doesn't mind that because he really, really is consistent um, from the baseline to, you know, and, and his consistency is a real weapon against most players. So whenever Zverev, I think, you know, moves forward, he, it's not that he doesn't do it well, but he is stepping out of his comfort zone. Offense is hard against Novak. But Zverev can't afford to be lulled into passivity and to stay in his comfort zone against a, a player like Djokovic. He needs every aspect of his game, and I don't think he generally has it. When Sasha plays Federer, Federer's, de uh, uh, Federer's offense is the intimidating part of his game, not his defense. The offense is what you don't want to deal with. Gee, I, I, I need to be aggressive against Roger. Because if I don't hurt him, he's going to hurt me. That's the intimidating part against playing Federer. So when Zverev plays Federer, he's always gloriously offensive. Gloriously. And I don't think that's the case against Novak because it's Novak's defense that presents real problems. And I think Zverev can sometimes shy away from his offensive tennis because of the way Djokovic defends. Now, the ATP Cup they played this year... And I think that Zverev played pretty offensively pretty well. But the Australian Open brings a, a different kind of pressure. And even in that match, where I think Zverev did some things well, and I think that his mindset was pretty good. Djokovic broke Zverev three times, and Zverev only broke Novak once. I will say this. This matchup will test Novak's forehand. It will test his fitness. These are both things that there there could be questions swirling. The The fitness is something that I've kind of been waiting to to really see from uh, all, all the way back, dating back to the end of 2020. And the forehand, of course, is injury-induced, right? He didn't need to hit, he didn't need to play long, physical, grueling rallies with Milos Raonic. He didn't. And he probably will in this one. Novak can't afford to favor the backhand to backhand in this matchup. So credit to Zverev. That is something that will make Zverev difficult to play for Novak or does make Zverev difficult to play. Uh, for Novak because Djokovic can't make that much progress on that cross-court pattern, so he needs to favor the forehand. Look for Djokovic, he does this very well, to change the pattern um, by trading his backhand down the line. When I And I'm talking about not a high-risk offensive backhand down the line, I'm talking about a low-risk pattern-changing backhand down the line, which his timing and his control is so good, he has the ability to do that better than most. Remember, Zverev also comes in with an abdomen injury. I don't think he's been serving quite as big, and he's going to need the free points against Novak. And the last thing I'll say, so so that's one thing to monitor, is, is Zverev serving as big as he can? He's going to need it. He's going to need it. I've been impressed with Novak serving. Djokovic is serving very, very well. And I'm excited to see what he does against Zverev because that's a step up in competition when it comes to, or it's a step up in level when it comes to return game. Zverev is a better returner than Novak has faced. My pick is Djokovic in four sets. Again, uh, there are there are things that I do like about what Zverev could potentially offer when it comes to uh, playing Novak Djokovic, but I do think that Djokovic has a tendency to get Zverev to play the wrong way. Let's see what happens. Again, I'm, uh, you know, questions about Zverev serving does not bode well. And um, Novak has had a lot of success against Sasha uh, on hard courts. I'm not, I'm not finding a compelling reason for that to change, especially because intangibles wise, Novak still might have an edge. Let us move on to the second quarter final in the top half of the draw. It will be Dominic Thiem and Aslan Karatsev. Let's start with the round of 16 matchups. Dimitrov defeated Dominic Thiem in three sets. Again, I thought that this was going to be the quarter of chaos. I got that one right. It wasn't to the opponent who I thought, but ultimately I might have just gotten lucky with that one because Dominic Thiem in this match against Grigor Dimitrov clearly got injured. 
Team started very well. He got up an early break, but he tweaked something in his foot and he began to exhibit noticeably clumsy footwork and subsequently with the big swings that that team takes, horrible control. The balls were spraying. They were flying. I tweeted that uh, it, it looked like he was playing with uh, string tension, 10 pounds too loose because the the misses were not even close at times. And it wasn't that I thought that like team didn't have his, uh, you know, his sprinting power. I do think that that he could he could cover the court. I thought his footwork really suffered, especially behind the serve. When Dimitrov put a good return in play, team would often error off the next ball because he could not get his feet in position in time. So that's something to watch out for if you go back and watch the tape. But it was a, an underwhelming match. It was a brutal performance by by Dominic Team. But again, um, I think he was injured and. Team did not want to take any credit away from his good friend Dimi when he had his press conference in English, but then he did divulge in an interview that he gave in Austrian that his foot was indeed bothering him throughout the match. All Dimitrov had to do in this match was extend rallies, which he did very, very well, and he got payoff. But to me, that's something that Dimitrov can kind of do in his sleep. It's easy for him. It's up his wheelhouse. And generally, if Dominic Team was himself, he would ask Grigor Dimitrov to, to do a lot more than he was able to ask Dimitrov to do. So I really don't take all that much out of Grigor Dimitrov's performance in this one. I thought he was playing well coming in, don't get me wrong, but you know I, I still think he's playing well, but I'm not blown away. I'm not incredibly impressed. I think that ultimately, despite the opponent, Dominic Team, I think this was relatively uh, routine for Dimitrov. Aslan Karatsev found himself down two sets to none against Felix Oje Aliasim. And then he made a couple of adjustments. He moved back on return, gave himself some more time. I think he moved back in general. He started giving him, himself more time in these rallies. Felix brings a lot of pace to the court. He takes time away. He hits big. And he has a tendency, as I will talk about a little bit later with Andre Rublev, he has a tendency to rush his opponents. On the contrary, he does not use a lot of angles. He does not come to the net with a lot of confidence. So moving back is a is a good play against Felix. And that's what Karatsev did in this match, and his confidence grew. The change in return position also seemingly threw off FAA's first serve, or the rhythm on his first serve. Or maybe the return position was unrelated, and Felix just lost his rhythm. Whatever it was, the, the first serve percentage was, was uh, rather abysmal. And that gave Karatsev plenty of easy openings on his return game. His first forehand became consistent and exceptional, and Karatsev got into a zone. And at the same time, I think Felix kind of started to panic when things weren't going his way. As the favorite, as someone who would just, you know, went up two sets to love, we saw so many examples of this in last year's U.S. Open. Sometimes players can panic when they when they lose that lead and the nerves can get the best of them. And I, I do think that FAA showed some great things in this tournament. And I actually think that his, uh, you know, his 2021 to me has been positive. I know some people won't agree with that. And they'll say, oh, he lost a final and he blew a lead. He's a choker. And, and I, I get that perspective. But I've seen technical things from FAA that I've been wanting to see. And I think signal uh, that improvement is on the way. But uh, Aslan Karatsev continued what is probably a top 20 level of tennis, uh, a level of tennis that is really predicated around simplicity and incredibly clean and consistent ball striking and great power, which all starts with uh, movement, which is is very balanced and you know solid as a rock. It kind of reminds me of uh, Yanko Tipsarovic in his prime, the way he, he has a, a very sturdy base his prime was very short, by the way, Tipsarovich. And I just thought of that, by the way. That was stream of consciousness. Um, I don't know who else he reminds me of. I, I, I saw Merit Safin, a little bit different than that, but um, incredible power on the forehand and um, really solid backhand. But I just feel like he's hitting the center of the strings with an unbelievable consistency. In terms of Dimitrov versus Karatsev, of course, they've never played. And, you know, Aslan's a great story. Let me just say that. Aslan has a chance to uh, surpass his career prize money mark with a win over uh, over Grigor in this one. And he's 27 years old, so it's a great story. 
Um, he's an incre he's an, in an incredible zone right now, and someone needs to snap him out of it. Really, someone needs to snap him out of it, or he's not going to lose until that happens. And I think for someone to do that, they need to offer something special, something that he hasn't seen before, something that is done at an elite level that he's not quite sure how to handle or he's not used to handling on the tennis court. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure Grigor is that guy. Now, some people make some very good points about Dimitrov's slice and how Karatsev might handle that. If you can move him inside the court where he's not quite as comfortable, if you force him to hit up on his backhand, how will Karatsev respond to that? I'm not sure. I think Dimitrov has a great slice. Uh, I do question his ability to to really commit to it on a consistent basis, but we could see about that. And sure, maybe Dimitrov's slice has a huge effect on this match and confounds Karatsev, and there there you have it. Or maybe Dimitrov plays better defense than anyone Karatsev has seen in um, in recent memory, and that's going to really bother Aslan, and that's going to be the thing that throws him off. But I kind of see Grigor as a guy who does a lot of things really well, so many things really well, but nothing unbelievable, although I think he is an exceptionally explosive athlete. Um, I don't know if he's the one. I think Karatsev might have one more in him. So I'm going to pick Karatsev in four sets. I know that he is an underdog in this one, but I'm going to roll with him. I think he's got one more. You know, I think like in the next round, I think Djokovic and Zverev both do things that Aslan has, has never had to deal with before. You know, things that might confound him, things that might be, you know, mystifying to him. And I, I don't know that Dimitrov is going to take him out of that comfort zone quite enough because right now he is so red hot as a player that I think that's the only way he lose, loses. So uh, I'm going to go with Karatsev one more. Let us take a break now from our quarterfinal previews with the DB4 Tennis Stat of the Week. DB4 Tennis. Check out more tennis history at www.db4tennis.com. In today's insight, we're going to talk about Novak Djokovic at the Australian Open. And there is a pattern that maybe should concern fans of Novak Djokovic. Let's see. Part of this is just that um, he's been so, so dominant. And that's kind of the, the two parts of this week's stat. So Novak Djokovic, ever since his triumph, this was his first major title at the Australian Open in 2008. He's won this eight times. Last time was, of course, one year ago in the 2020 rendition of the tournament. In the years that he has not won the Australian Open, three out of five times that has taken place in the quarterfinals. So we can see a pattern of Novak, how important it is getting through the quarterfinals. Because once he's passed that stage, he is unbelievably hard to beat in Melbourne. Not to mention that the only retirement in his Australian Open campaign dated all the way back to 2009, a quarterfinal loss to Andy Roddick. Against all of his opponents in those three quarterfinals, Djokovic had wins before that match against them. He had already beaten Roddick, Sanga, Vavrinka, and the same can be said about Sasha Zverev, who Djokovic will have to play in the next round. Djokovic has never won the Australian Open without dropping a set. His first two victorious runs in Melbourne, he dropped just one set. In 2012, he actually lost five sets, one in round four, two in the semifinal, then two in that final, that famous five-hour, 53-minute final against Rafa Nadal. The only time when Djokovic has lost sets in three consecutive rounds, it was in 2009, and in that year, he did not reach the final. And as we sit right now, Novak Djokovic has lost sets in three consecutive rounds. This table shows how Djokovic's set winning ratio, the one, the one, the win loss game and game difference, um, relates to his performance and the outcome of his campaigns. When his set ratio is below eighty percent, he has never won an Aussie Open title. His current data set is identical to his numbers in 2009 when he had that retirement against Andy Roddick. So, our friends at DB4 Tennis are predicting some trouble for Novak Djokovic 
in his next match against Alexander Zverev in that quarterfinal. A couple of historical patterns going against the serve. Oh, that's not the one I was trying to put up. So we thank our partners at DB4 Tennis, as always. Let us go to the next quarterfinal matchup. Man, this is one I'm looking forward to. Third quarterfinal is between the Russians, the exceptional Russians, Daniil Medvedev and Andrei Rublev. I feel for Andrei Rublev. I still think that I'm still disappointed that this was his draw because um, this was the same thing at the, the U.S. Open. And Rublev has a terrible head-to-head -head against his good friend, his pal from ever since childhood, Daniil Medvedev. Medvedev is 4-0 against Rublev, and he has never dropped a set. Medvedev beat Mackie McDonald in straight sets. Um, Rublev defeated Kasper Ruud after going up two sets to love. Ruud retired. I'm not going to go in any kind of depth into those matches because they're not worth it. So let me just jump straight into uh, Daniil Medvedev and Andrei Rublev in this matchup. This is the quarterfinal that I least want to predict, but also the quarterfinal that I most want to watch. Let me first just kind of address what I think has happened in this head-to-head -head and some of the reasons why Daniil Medvedev is 4-0 against, uh, against Rublev. Quite simply put, the things Rublev does, the ways Rublev has his success, these are not things that bother Daniil Medvedev. Most players on tour are very uncomfortable playing Andre Rublev because of pace, intensity, consistency. I think those are the three things. When it comes to pace, obviously there are two variables. Don't just think about how hard a ball is hit. Do not, it, it, because it's completely misleading. You might look at the average ground stroke speed on tour, and Andre Rublev, I think he'd be up there, but he might not be number one. But speed combined with time, that is pace. That is pace. Because that is um, the speed at which the ball travels to the other side of the court, the speed to which your opponent will, you know, will now need to hit the ball and it will, you know, cross the plane, uh, so to speak, of, uh, of the opponent. That is pace. Andre Rublev's pace is exceptional. He rushes everyone he plays. He hits it massive. He takes it early. Uh, he... He hits close to the line, and he does so with consistency, and he does so with an unbelievable, unrelenting intensity every single shot. And Daniil Medvedev simply has no problem with pace. He simply redirects it. He loves redirecting pace. He does not get rushed. His stroke mechanics are, are quite long, but somehow you can't really rush him. And... He has no problem with consistency because he's more consistent than anyone else, especially on the backhand side. And the intensity doesn't really bother him either. So these things don't bother him. One thing I will add is that Andre Rublev's first strike is really possibly the best on tour. I think it's, it's Federer-esque, I want to say. Just that, just the first strike. First ball after the serve. He's tremendous by every metric. You look at his first serve percent um, one, right? First serve points one percentage. He is the tournament leader in that statistic right now. He's like 12th in aces. And I know uh, it's a little bit misleading based on opponent, based on service points played. But last year, Rublev was fifth in uh, on tour in first serve points one. And you can look at the list. He's, he's among these trees. He's among Raonic. He's among... Um, players like, uh, I don't, I don't have it up, but I looked at it earlier. Uh, players like, you know, huge servers, players like Nick Kyrgios. Um, these are the players that Rublev is kind of nestled in between and Rublev has a great first serve, but it's not that good. It's his first shot. It's the first forehand specifically, but even when it's, uh, he can even do, do damage with his first backhand. That is, uh, very much mitigated by Rublev's second serve, which isn't a great second serve. Uh, so, you know, there's one difference between him and Federer. Um, but I think that Medvedev is very Djokovic-like. He really disrupts that, that first strike tennis. His, re the, his depth of return is tremendous. Uh, so that's another thing to watch out for is, 
Um, how much will Medvedev, as he usually does in this matchup, how much will Medvedev neutralize Rublev's first strike with the return? Watch out for that. Nothing I've seen suggests that Rublev has changed much. Nothing. I don't think that he's added a backhand slice. I don't think that his willingness to come forward has exponentially increased. I don't think that any of those things are going to really change the dynamic. There's only one thing that I am confident about with Andre Rublev, and that is uh, I think that he's gotten bigger. I think that he has gotten stronger, um, and I think he's moving better. When I say he's gotten bigger, I think he's hitting bigger and he's moving faster. That's what's changed with Rublev. I think he's just become a better version of himself. And don't get it, get it twisted. At some point, there is a breaking point here. If Rublev's average ground stroke speed continues to increase, at some point, it is going to give Medvedev trouble. This is not an infinite equation. You, you can't just say, well, Medvedev likes pace, so it doesn't matter how Rublev hits it, it's going to be fine. No. No. It's not how it's going to work. There is a certain point at which even Medvedev can be rushed. So I don't think that, that Rublev's game has really changed at all. I just think that he's hitting bigger and he's gotten faster. So the question is, has he passed that threshold? You know, is he going to be able to beat Medvedev with the, the, the same game that has been so unsuccessful against Anil time and time again? Uh, because I do think that Rublev's a better player now than, than he was in those four previous meetings, including last year's U.S. Open. Um, but ultimately, it's probably not probably not going to be enough and I have Medvedev. I will I will say Daniil Medvedev in um I'm going to say 5 sets. I'm going to say 5 sets because I really I really respect the level that Andre Rublev is bringing right now and at some point you have to wonder if uh if something is going to click here for Rublev in this matchup because it won't continue like this. It won't. Rublev's too good a player. The the gap between these two players in level are a little bit too close for it to be this one-sided. So look, let me change it to four sets. This is the way I predict. Three sets, I'm quite sure who's going to win. Four sets, I'm confident with my pick. Uh, but I could see the other player winner, winning. Five sets, I'm not really sure, but I'm giving you a lean. So I'm going to say four sets because I am confident in picking Daniil Medvedev. Uh, but I, I also am so interested to see what Andre Rublev uh, can do here to, tr to uh, challenge him. Our fourth and final quarterfinal on the very bottom half of the draw will be between Rafael Nadal and Stefanos Tsitsipas. Rafa defeated Fabio Fanini in three sets. I think that this was a closer match than the scoreline would tell you, but I really liked, I really enjoyed watching this match. I thought it was great, um, especially for a young player. I think that this, the, uh, this matchup kind of encapsulates what's so good about Rafa Nadal because... It's very inaccurate to say that Nadal doesn't have unbelievable racket talent and shot-making ability. Extremely, you know, it couldn't be more inaccurate to say that. But I also think it's accurate to say that Fabio Fanini has just as much. Again, that's more of a compliment to Fabio, not a not at all. Um, that has nothing to do with uh, Nadal, but Fabio is unbelievably talented. Unbelievably. Uh, with the racket, right? But uh, Joel Drucker shared a, a quote from Billie Jean King. Persistence is talent. So it's weird how we define talent, right? And I think that this matchup is a, is a great uh, signa indication of that, um, that very fact because uh, there's a consistency gap here. So the question is, well, if it's not racket talent, if, if Fanini hits the ball just as well as Nadal can hit the ball um, in flashes, what are the ingredients of consistency. Well, three things that I thought of just watching this match. Discipline and shot selection, intensity and footwork, and commitment to focus. Those three things. There were some very key um, Love 40 games here that uh, in the second set especially where Fanini dug out of the Love 40 and then lost his focus. Nadal dug out of the love 40 and kept his focus. So commitment to focus is mental. Intensity and footwork is just, you know, 
Nadal never takes a shot off. He needs to get in the right position. And sometimes Fanini is just lazy. Let's let's just say how it is. Fanini can be lazy with the feet, and he's not as intense there. And sometimes it's okay because Fanini is a very pure mover. So when he calculates his movement correctly, he can always be in the right position. But sometimes he is in the wrong position, and that you know you can have just as good. You can time the ball just as well. You can have hand-eye coordination just as good. And those are the ingredients for racket talent, hand-eye coordination, timing. These are things sometimes to a certain extent you can't teach. And, you know, Nadal and Fanini are both unbelievable. Um, but Nadal just works harder with his feet, works harder. And you can just see that. Just watch this matchup. And then discipline and shot making is just, of course, again, you can see a lot of the, uh, a lot of the misses that Fabio hit were overly ambitious and just, again, undisciplined. So great match, three-set match, great match to watch for three sets, even though it wasn't competitive, especially in the third set, because I, I just think this is a, a really interesting contrast here. Tsitsipas got a walkover from Matteo Berrettini after smoking Elias Emer, the, the Swede, and that brings us to Nadal versus Tsitsipas. This is a, a matchup defined by fierce competition. I love it when these two, two play. Uh, Titi Pass has unbelievable respect for Rafael Nadal, and I think that he really welcomes the challenge and generally brings his best game to the court, and that's why they've played great matches. I've noticed that the surface is not responding to spin as much. Now, both of these players like to play with a lot of spin, so who is going to adapt? I think that Nadal adapts a little bit better than Tsitsipas um, in this case. Uh, I do see Nadal doing pretty well in both cross-court patterns because of the way the court is playing. Nadal's backhand is much flatter than Tsitsipas's forehand. And on some courts, uh, Steph's forehand, again, just kind of like Nadal's forehand, can really hop off the court and it has a, a very unique heaviness to it. And I don't know if this court is really having the same effect, which is going to force Tsitsipas to flatten it out a little bit, but he doesn't do it that well. So I think that Nadal's backhand um, is going to... I think that that side, that Nadal's going to find opportunities on that side to actually dictate terms of play out of a neutral baseline rally. So look out for that. Of course, on the other cross court, Nadal's forehand to Tsitsipas's backhand, of course, I think Rafa has a, a very sturdy advantage there. And generally speaking, unless there's a serve return dynamic that is going to change my mind, if a player has what I think might be an advantage on both cross courts, I am going to pick the player who has that advantage. Let me be very clear. I do think conditions have a lot to do with this. And on, believe it or not, a, a slower hard court or even some clay courts, I actually think that um, the cross court on the deuce side would favor Tsitsipas. I just think Nadal, with the prowess of his backhand on a fast, uh, more slick surface, like we've seen at Wimbledon the last couple of years, that backhand can be, can be great on these kinds of uh, surfaces. Um, I do think that Nadal is really going to test Tsitsipas's backhand return, but also mix it up at the same time. Nadal has a tremendous ability to do that. He His serve strategy is is so great, and he is going to feel out Tsitsipas's return. I'm very confident that he will have the right game plan, and he will make the right adjustments mid-match to muster the most out of his serve that he can with what he has to offer. And to that, to that uh, point... Steph's return is not always the most, you know, solid, well-rounded thing in the world. Don't look for free points when it comes to this dynamic. Don't look for free points because while Nadal might get some free points, that's not really the crux of what Nadal can extract out of his serve here. It is instead the plus one tennis that I be believe he will um, find a lot of opportunities by attacking the Tsitsipas return and hitting all the right buttons and mixing it around the box in all the right places. And I think Nadal will have opportunities there. Um, I also would look for Tsitsipas's backhand defense. And it's a major difference between when Nadal plays Dominic Team, for example, to, to use another one-handed backhand, uh, versus when Nadal plays Stefano Tsitsipas. I do believe that Nadal um, can attack the backhand defense which with much more success against a player like Tsitsipas, which is very important in this matchup. 
I think that Tsitsipas' success revolves around moving forward, and um, I'm curious to see how much success that he does have moving forward. If he does, I could see this being a matchup that is somewhat serve dominant. I think both players can have a lot of success when they're on their front foot playing offense um, in these kind of quick conditions. They're both so great offensively. Perhaps we'd see some tie breaks if that is the case. But ultimately, something that might be very daunting for Tsitsipas is to equal Nadal's levelness and to equal his big point play. Those two things will be very difficult. I'm not sure if he's ready to do it. I think that Tsitsipas' game is plenty explosive enough to hang in there, but those will be major hurdles if Tsitsipas wants to win the match. I'm picking Rafael Nadal in four sets. These should be good. I'm sure I'll get some of these wrong because they're close, intriguing matches, uh, but I am looking forward to them, and I'm looking forward to continued coverage here on Monday Match Analysis. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time.